What's up, guys? This is Brandon coming at you with Brothers of Merit. I got Taylor along with me. What's going on, man? How's it going, brother? It is awesome. We got Steve Chapman on the episode tonight. It was an awesome interview, as usual. Just a disclaimer to everyone listening, he is a avid hunter. I mean, he's done it his entire life, and it was just an amazing interview with him. But before we get to that, Taylor, routine housekeeping. I'm going to take us through some routine housekeeping real quick. Um, and as always, that starts with thank you. Again, we have seen just an incredible amount of feedback, especially over this past week, and we just want to say thank you. And with everything, as always, we just pour those blessings back. All the praise goes to God. He's the He's the one who's doing everything here. But we just want to say thank you to everybody who's showing us support. Rates and reviews are huge for us, so we, we cannot thank you enough for sharing this out. The mission of getting this out to as many men as possible is only happening when you guys do that so we just want to say thanks and as always check out the our instagram handle that's where we have news about giveaways that are coming up with this episode with steve chapman we have some pretty cool giveaways that are coming so you can find that out at instagram and as well as winners of past giveaways as well so make sure you're tuned into that and if you're a man make sure you check out our facebook group as well absolutely so before we get into it like i said steve is a big outdoorsman he's hunted and fished his entire life he loves it, and that has really connected him with God, and he goes over that in the interview. It has not only connected him with God, but it's connected him in ways of being a better father, being a better husband, and just being a better friend, and he hits on all of that. So from Taylor and I not being hunters, we pulled stuff from it, so we know you guys will. So he goes over songs that he actually wrote. However, he doesn't sing them, but he speaks through them. But if you're interested, you can check him out. You know, go to our website as usual in the past guest tab or look in the show description to the link for him and you can listen to him. It, they were they were pretty wild and, and we, we really enjoyed it. So, yeah. And that he sings or I guess says one song in particular in the middle of the episode. And I'm telling you, chills about just, yeah, about being a the son and the father. It was, we'll it just, was awesome. We'll let you guys listen to that. So let's uh, let's take it in, man. All right. We'll see you on the other side. All right. All righty, Mr. Steve Chapman, how you doing tonight, sir? Hey, fine, thank you. Good to be with you. Yes, sir, we're appreciative of you coming on to our show. Um, I know a lot of our listeners are very big into the outdoors and to hunting, and I know they're going to love listening to the stories that you have to provide and also just the aspects of how God walked with you through those stories and how he gave you the strength to push through whatever times you went through in them as well. So yeah, Mr. Chapman, just uh, if you could, just kind of, you know, to our listeners, give them a little bit about yourself, your background, your testimony, you know, where you're from and, and what you do and, and let them get to know you a little bit. Yeah, from what I make that known, uh, although we live in Tennessee, my, uh, my birth town is Chapmanville, West Virginia, so the roots run deep. I started dating in 1975, we got married in 77, we had a son named Nathan, and then in 1980 had a daughter named Heidi. They're all grown up and potty trained and got their own families and everything, <laughs> and uh, uh, now they've presented us with six grandbabies, four doe and two buck in the grand herd, and, and boy, you know, that's a... Uh, it took what about two minutes to tell that, and that's about how fast it's gone by. I'm sure. Uh, all those years, well, Annie and I will celebrate our 44th anniversary on uh, in the month of March of this year, and uh, so we're heading to the big 5-0, and hopefully we'll make it there. But uh, it's been an incredible journey uh, through the years with Annie and our kids, and we started Annie and I started singing together in 19. 19- 80 as a duet I, we were in a group before that but uh in 1980 we started traveling as a duet and took our kids with us and um uh, i think I, I was listening to one of your previous broadcasts with i believe it's randy hemphill mm-hmm. and on that broadcast i don't know if it was taylor but somebody did a 24 hour uh, uh stayed up for 24 hours Who, was that you taylor yeah that was me yep you're a crazy man he is he is <laughs> a little bit but uh, i thought you know i've done that too but I, I did it with kids, with infants. And, sure. and if you if y'all if if y'all have had kids, then you know what that's about. Oh, 100 uh, percent. Oh, yeah. stay up for 24 hours, but uh, at least it feels that way. That was that was all I did for training. Was I just I just had a kid and then I was ready to go. <laughs> well, I've I've done a a few marathons, so I awesome. I know what it's like. But anyway, we uh, we traveled together as a family and. Uh, 
our kids traveled, they called it from colic to college. And in uh, ni- about 1995 uh, or so, Annie and I went back to being a duet, and we've done that ever since. And uh, in 1996, we had written a couple of books for uh, Bethany Publishers up in Minneapolis. And uh, I was at a deer camp in uh, over in uh, Nebraska, and there was like 25 hunters there. And my job was to lead uh, devotions in the evening and music before the guys went to bed and would hunt the next morning. And, and it was a cold um, period of uh, the weather was cold. And one of the guys came in for, for dinner and we were sitting around the uh, fireplace and I started leading worship and we started talking about the day's hunt. And uh, one of the guys said, you know, I was sitting on the stand this morning and the, uh, it was so cold, my, my breath was just boiling out of my mouth. And he said, I knew the deer could see that in the, as it uh, boiled up in the sun. And he said, I tried to stop it. And he said, I finally gave up and just started playing with it. And then, and then he said, and all of a sudden it, I realized, I thought about that James passage that says life is but a vapor. He said, I, I would blow the vapor out of my mouth, the mist, and it would go out there and hang a little bit and then disappear. And he said, that's my life. I, I was making a picture of my life. I'm, I'm not, I'm here for a little while, then I'm gone. And I thought, man, I've had that same thought about that passage sitting on a deer stand. I wonder how many other guys have had that. So I wrote a chapter about that, my first chapter, and then 14 other chapters about things I'd seen while in the woods and uh, enjoying uh, creation and put together a book called A Look at Life from a Deer Stand. And uh, that, uh, that book, there was nothing like it in the Christian marketplace. We uh, printed 10,000 copies, and I, got a gar- I had a garage full of books I didn't know what to do with. But the lady that worked with us, I said, and this was back when uh, there were a lot of mom-and-pop Christian bookstores, and I said, okay. I want you to call 25 stores and tell them we'll send them a dozen books. And I put the uh, book on CD on uh, cassette. Y'all remember cassettes? Oh yeah. (laughs) So I said, we will pay for the shipping out and we'll consign the books and what they don't sell, they pay for the shipping back. And within two months or so, we had sold 30,000 copies. Holy moly. I mean, uh, 10,000 copies. So we had another 10, uh, uh, printed and we I had no idea that I would the book would connect in, in such a way with other hunters and I've had uh, wives tell me that they their husbands have never read a book until that one hmm. so what a privilege it was to uh, and a surprise to to be able to connect with a lot of hunters and then we, we did everything we could with the book and and then I sent it to Harvest House out in Oregon and uh, they welcomed the book and, and began to, uh, they made their own uh, version of it cover wise. And I was counting the books up. I've, I have 14 now about either hunting or uh, about kids and fishing and, and that kind of thing. So uh, that's a little bit of history of how I got into this. And, and I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to, uh, to share about something I, I enjoy doing so much. Yeah, definitely. And, it, and clearly the outdoors has played a huge role in your life. And I mean, 14 books and fishing and hunting. And so where did that passion start? Like what, how was it just because you were born into it and, you know, your family did it or did you, you know, start to do that when you were younger, just on your own or what? Well, I love that question. And I'll tell you why my, uh, my dad, Typically, hunting comes through family, through a dad and a brother, an uncle, or, you know, but in my case, my dad was not a hunter. He was not a fisherman. He was not an outdoorsman. He, his passion, he was bivocational. He pastored a church in West Virginia and worked at, a, at an aluminum plant. So his time was fully consumed. And I respected that and uh, grew up in, in Point Pleasant, uh, running the streets and riding my bicycle, playing baseball and doing in town stuff. I'd never been in the woods, but he had a, uh, a fellow, Kenneth Bledsoe went to church where my dad pastored and, uh, 
Kenneth had two daughters and at the time didn't have a son, but uh, he, he come to me one Sunday after church and he said, Steve, you ever been in the woods? You ever hunted? And I said, no, sir. I uh, never been in the woods. He said, have you ever handled a shotgun? I said, no, sir. He said, would you like to go squirrel hunting with me next Saturday? Squirrel season comes in. And um, I said, well, let me ask my dad. And so I, I went to dad and I said, Mr. Bledsoe wants me to go hunt with him next Saturday. Is it okay? And he paused a long pause. And what I didn't know, guys, at, I didn't understand it in that moment what was going through his head. You see, his dad, my grandfather Chapman, uh, was missing his right arm because when he was eight years old, his 12-year-old brother accidentally shot his arm off with a shotgun in, a, in an accident. And my grandfather went through life with that handicap because of a shotgun. So when I asked dad about going with uh, Kenneth Bledsoe into the woods with a shotgun, that's what ran through his head. Hmm. But he said, after a long pause, he said, yeah, that, that's, it'd, be, it'd be fine. Hmm. And I'm sure he trusted Kenneth, but I also right. think he probably thought I needed something like that. And uh, so he let me go and, and uh, Kenneth introduced me to the world of hunting that first morning, I'll never forget. He, uh, he put me by a tree, he showed me how to use the gun the night before I stayed overnight with him. He showed me how to use the gun and gave me a handful of shells to carry to the, to the, uh, to the tree with me and I sat down by a tree and he, he said, now I'm going to leave you here. Don't, don't go nowhere. I'm going to come back and get you. I don't want to lose you on this mountain. He said, uh, stay right here. I'll be back. And in the darkness, he stood up and walked away from me in the woods, left me sitting a little city slick, slicker kid sitting there in the woods by himself, <laughs> left me sitting there and, and everything I looked at looked like a monster. The, the, the shapes and shadows in, in the uh, near darkness, it started getting daylight, but he had a time perfect. And uh, in just a few minutes, that uh, big orange ball came up over the horizon. I started hearing birds chirping and uh, the night shift in the Critter world was uh, getting, was going to bed and the day shift was getting up and man, I was sitting there and I, I was totally enthralled in this environment. And I sat there for about an hour and a half and I didn't get a shot at a squirrel. I didn't know you're supposed to sit still, but, uh, <laughs> and I had a couple of candy bars and drank a Coke and, you know, just kind of shifted around. So it's no wonder I didn't see anything, but I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I get a tap on the shoulder. And I, I didn't hear anybody walk up behind me, but I got a tap on the shoulder and I thought, should I turn around and see what's about to eat me? And uh, there stood Kenneth. And in full voice, I said, how'd you do that? How'd you sneak up on me like that? He squatted down. He said, uh, in a low voice, he said, Steve, I'll teach you how to do that uh, later. But he said, he said the saddest words in hunting that morning. He said, the hunt's over. Hmm. And... Uh, the saddest words in golf, it's still your turn. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Saddest words in motorcycling, that's going to hurt. <laughs> but the saddest words in hunting is the hunt's over. Uh, guys, I hated to get up and leave the woods that morning. That's how much I loved it. And I've been, I left with an empty game bag, but a heart full of want to. Mm. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. I was about 12, 13 years old at the time. And, uh, Kenneth didn't know what he didn't know was, and, and then maybe, maybe he did, but uh, he sowed into my life some benefits that I've gleaned through the years from being an outdoorsman hmm. and uh, benefits like, uh, oh, the solitude of a deer stand, man, there's nothing, nothing better than that. And there's nothing better than sleep on a deer stand. <laughs> it's ugly, but it's sweet. Five minutes of sleep in a deer stand is like a week's vacation, but I love the solitude of a, of a deer stand. The food is a great benefit. What a valuable resource we have in, in the form of uh, mm -hmm. these critters and the fish and the, and the birds. It's a, it's a very clean source of meat mm -hmm. and uh, flesh. And, uh, and then there's the uh, benefit of getting to be on the conservation team here in America. Uh, one of the most important components of the 
of the conservation team are the hunters and, and uh, also the fishermen. And uh, they, we help keep the numbers down. And if people don't believe the hunter is not important, they need to come to Tennessee and drive the highways and see all the Chevy Ot 6 kills along our roads. Yeah. They're everywhere. Sure. And they're, they're uh, messing up a lot of cars. So the, the hunter, I get to be on that team. That's a great benefit. But one of the most important benefits of having been a hunter through the years and a fisherman and the lover of the outdoors is how it allowed me to connect to my kids. One one benefit that it's yielded, I don't know if you guys are like me, but as a man, if I'm going to talk to you, I'd rather be doing something and talking to you than just talking to you. Sure, side by side. Uh, yeah. Like being on the bank of a of a of a lake or a creek or a pond or in a boat, and you got a guy, two guys who are casting and reeling in and changing baits and all this stuff, and while all that's going on you're talking to one another that can happen when you're out there with kids. If a lot of guys are like me, I, I, I found it easier to talk to my kids when I was doing something with them. And, uh, one thing that's, that happens when you talk to a kid is sometimes things will be said that really need to be said. And sometimes things will be said that really need to be heard. And, uh, I have a song called first one that, that talks about this and it's uh, it goes like this we were side by side in daddy's old deer stand a cold december day i couldn't feel my hands and then he whispered my name and he looked out through the timber and what happened just then i'll always remember he said i love you son i'm proud of my boy i'm glad you came along you've been my joy to get a trophy like that is the dream of every son and that day was the day i got my first one he was facing 52. I was pushing 23. Don't know why it took so long for him to say those words to me. We hunted hard that day, but we didn't pull the trigger. Oh, but what I took home, they don't come any bigger. Cause he said, I love you, son. I'm proud of my boy. I'm glad you came along. You've been my joy to get a trophy like that. It's the dream of every son. And that day was the day I got my first one. And I've sung that song at a lot of wild game dinners and uh, I'll have guys come up to me after and say, you know, my dad's in his fifties and I've never heard him say, mm. I love you, son. Mm. Never heard him say, I'm proud of you. Never heard him say you're mine. And uh, I've seen tears in, in guys' eyes while they've said that. That's... And it's been a joy too, to hear guys tell me afterwards, he said, I'm, I'm going to go tell my boy I love him. Mm -hmm. And those of us who heard those words growing up from a dad, I love you. We don't know sometimes how deep the need is in the hearts of those who've never heard those words mm -hmm. for whatever reason, either separation, divorce, sometimes death, uh, just, uh, you know, a dad unable to say those words because they weren't poured into him, but for whatever reason, they've never heard them. And and they, uh, it, it's a, uh, it's a tough thing to, uh, to not hear those words. And, and I encourage at these wild game dinners, I'll encourage the, the dads to, uh, overcome the negatives of the past and sow those words into their kids. And what a joy it is to think that maybe somewhere there's a child, a son or a daughter that, uh, has heard those words because of a dad that's heard that encouragement. So, um, you know, that's, that's a benefit that a dad can glean for being taking a kid outdoors. Boy, what, what a place. And, and you can also take an excuse away from kids for not knowing their creator because of Romans 120 that says, uh, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made. And, uh, you know, taking a kid out into creation, they're going to learn about their creator and it takes away their excuse for not believing that he exists. So uh, there's just a couple of benefits from uh, I've, I've gleaned from being an outdoorsman in, 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 in regards to my role as a father. That's, that's awesome. I love that so much that, uh, I mean, the first thing that uh, kind of jumped out to me when you were saying that is um, like when you're talking about when you were 12 or 13 and that's when you fell in love with it was that morning um, and you didn't even pull the trigger. Like you didn't even like get that, like, 
you didn't even get the the trophy or whatever like you didn't have a quote unquote successful hunt but that's the time when you you fell in love with it that's when you became passionate about it and then yeah. I also because I, I guess I love that because you were so young you didn't know what you were doing and it just reminds me about like when Jesus says to come with me with faith like a child like you now later like now you know you know if I would have been quiet it would have been more successful or whatever but like you fell in love with it without having any of that knowledge without having any of that that wisdom about it you didn't know what you were doing but God you know spoke to you there and God you know like lit yeah. that passion lit that fire I, I love that that's awesome actually I've never thought of that that's that's a good point I may have to put that in the book <laughs> I like that that's, that's Taylor Dooley <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get quoted there no yeah that's, no that's yeah, awesome I don't, I don't pay royalty though that's fine <laughs> I, that's fine I'll let you you can have the first one for free yeah um, yeah let me let me say this too uh Sometimes a dad, like hunters, you know, they long so much for their sons and in a lot of cases, their daughters to join them in the hunter's woods. I encourage men to uh, not force uh, their children into doing the thing that they like to do uh, if, if they're a hunter. And, and the reason that for that is God may, you know, and I t here's what I tell them. If you take a kid hunting, and they kill a deer, for example, or you kill a deer, and you sense in them an excessive remorse. It just breaks their heart. While I believe there should be some remorse and respect for the animal, mm -hmm. if it's excessive, that child may not be a hunter, and God may want to use their core character in another way. And the, uh, the biblical illustration I use of that is Jacob and Esau. Yep. Uh, the scriptures calls them both men, Jacob, he, the scripture calls him a man of the tent, and Esau was a man of the field. Jacob was a city slicker, Esau was a country boy, and Esau was a hunter. The Bible calls both of them men. You don't have to hunt to be a man. That's important for a dad to remember, not to force a child into doing the thing they like to do. They, what they need to do is find out what that child likes to do and get engaged with them. Like um, my son loved to ride the bicycle. So we, we rode 500 miles from Nashville area to West Virginia to see his grandparents. And I'll tell you, there's, there's an easier way to get there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it took seven days, it took seven days. He was 15 years old Jeez. and he was, uh, you guys may be too young to remember Greg Lamond, the, the Tour de France winner uh, years ago. Nathan wanted to be uh, Greg LeMond. He had a Greg LeMond bicycle and all this stuff. And so I got me a diamond back and, and put some panniers on it. And we, we got our bags loaded up and headed off to West Virginia. And uh, just to, quickly, I'll tell you this. My goal was to teach Nathan how, how to set a goal and to work at it until you got it, until you reach the goal. So, I thought a bicycle trip would be great. So we, we got our fannies all um, calloused up by training ahead of time. <laughs> and I mapped out uh, roads that seemed to be safe. And then, you know, in 96, there weren't as many cars back then. But uh, we, we took off and, and uh, got up in the middle of Kentucky. I'll never forget this. We, were, we, we had cl climbed a wrong, uh, long hill and it, there was a nice winding road, just a little two lane road along a uh, ridge and the ridge uh, ride was looked like it was going to be a, a good time for a rest. But we were riding along. I looked over to my right and I'm eye level with this yard and way back, uh, I don't know, I don't know, 75, 80 yards off the road was a shack with a high porch. And I looked under the porch and I saw some dogs stand up they saw our helmets and here they come across that yard. They drop off the bank and I yell at Nathan, grab your halt. And that halt is a pepper spray that bikers use. It's for dogs and rednecks and things. And uh, <laughs> we, uh, I said, I said, it's dogs, Nate. We got a, we got a sprint. So we, we hit the pedals and, and uh, the dogs came out in the road and Nathan took his halt and sprayed it at him but he sprayed it over the front tire and then rode into the spray. 
Oh, man. And he grabbed his eyes and he ran off into the ditch and uh, wrecked his bike. He didn't hurt it, but the dogs came over and, you know, as if to say, ah, we're just messing with you. Thankfully, they weren't uh, vicious. But <laughs> we, we, anyway, we got through that stuff like that and, and staying in little hotels that were full of spiders, just, just, you know, stuff you end up talking about. If it all goes well, you don't talk about it. You, you talk about the bad stuff. Absolutely. So we get to uh, West Virginia and there's a, I told him before we left, there's a big blue bridge that crosses the Kanoa river and goes into Point Pleasant. And uh, we'll be able to see that bridge probably a mile and a half before we get to it. And I said, when we see the big blue bridge, you'll know we've, we're about to reach our goal. So finally the big blue bridge comes into sight and we get to the end of the bridge. And my dad had planned, I would called him uh, th three or four hours before we got there and told him about what time we'd hopefully arrive. And he had the police escort and the newspaper was there. It's, it's a big deal. And I broke out these t-shirts that I had made up that Nathan hadn't seen. And uh, anyway, move, he was 15, move ahead to, he's 18 now. And he's, he's learned how to uh, uh, run sound uh, mixer in, in a studio. We had a little studio in the basement. And we were doing an album, and he was producing it. And one of the machines broke down. We had, we had a um, musician in, in the studio who was $160 for a three-hour session, and, and he couldn't play because the machine broke down. So Nathan's under all this pressure. We went through that recording process. It was, it was very grueling for him. But uh, we get to, to the mixing part of it, where we're mixing the sounds. And uh, we're about halfway through a song, about halfway through the mix of 10 songs. And, he, and the machine is playing. And he reaches up and he stops the machine. And he looks over and he says, Dad, I think I see the big blue bridge. And it told me that those seven days that I spent with him will benefit him for the rest of his life because that recording process was almost over. And he, he referred to that big blue bridge. We're almost there. Hmm. And, uh, I, I will brag on Nathan. He ended up, he's a, a Grammy winning producer. He, he produced, uh, some upstarts named Taylor Swift. When she was 15, they met and he started producing her and produced uh, her first uh, three and part of her fourth album. And uh, so he is. He, oh, well, he's cool. a, I mean, that's he's definitely a, worthy of, of bragging for sure. That's amazing. Yeah, I'd say so. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm quick to do that. <laughs> <laughs> As parents, we all, yeah, we all are. It's, yeah. it's, well, it's well deserved, obviously. I mean, it seems like he worked his butt off and he's been very successful. And it, it all started from the foundation that you know you built in him yeah and and a lot of it started in the outdoors and uh, that's why i just really encourage guys to you know if they don't like the outdoors find something to do with a kid you know and in tennessee one of the great things to do is take them fishing you don't have to go hunting take them fishing if you want to make a sweet memory with your kids here's the recipe peanut butter and a jar of jam a loaf of bread and pop in a can bamboo poles and hooks on the line a can of worms and some of your time don't forget that little round bobber and all you do is just add water <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely right because all of that is relevant to that's all you need for just a afternoon of fun with your buddies and just fishing yeah and, and i'll tell you about one other benefit that uh, i've gleaned from being a hunter i actually i'll very quickly tell you too one is it's made me a better husband and when I say that at wild game dinners, if the wives are present, I, I see their eyes roll. They, they're thinking, yeah, right. Yeah. Hunting can make you a better husband. And, and here's how it can happen. And this is what I encourage hunters to understand that their favorite question is see anything. You know, if, if, if you're out hunting with a guy and you've agreed to have lunch at the truck before you go back out in the evening, and you're approaching him and he's got the tailgate down. He's got the bologna sandwiches out and the white bread and the mayonnaise and the Cheetos and the Coke, you know, one of those great meals. And he sees you coming up the logging road. He's going to turn around. The first question he's going to ask you, see anything? Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell the ladies, if they want, if they have a husband 
that has a hard time talking and, and he's a hunter, all you got to do is when he comes home, ask him if he'd see anything and he'll talk to her till she drops, passes out. <laughs> and, uh, guys love that question. And uh, what I've done through the years is, is I've actively and deliberately looked for links between the scripture and the creation. I've looked for links between creation and scripture. Sometimes I'll read scripture and see something there and I'll see an illustration of it in the outdoors. Or sometimes I'm in the outdoors and I'll see, see something happen there and then be reading the scripture and see a connection between those two things. And that's what my books are filled with. Um, stories that, that, uh, that pull those two things together, the scripture and creation because of Romans 120 that I, I mentioned a while ago. Um, and and uh, when I come home and I say, Annie, what I saw today, boy, it, it was so important to me. It, and uh, it, it's changed my character. And, and let me give you an example. I, Annie's brothers up in West Virginia built me a, a deer stand, a, a tree stand. And I got in it and stayed in it, hunted in it for uh four out of five days. And because I knew the, I knew the mountain and I knew the ridge and I knew there was a lot of deer in the area, but I, I was in that thing for four days and didn't see a thing, hardly a squirrel. And, uh, uh the next morning I decided I'm going to, I'm going to go somewhere else on the farm because this place is not working. And about that time I hear this crashing sound behind me in a ravine and I knew what it was because it was mating season or the rut season for the deer. And during the, that uh, mating season, the buck will just at with abandon chase and chase a doe who is, uh, you know, showing signs that she's ready to mate. Well, I heard that crashing sound and I knew that was a buck chasing doe and I turn around and sure enough, I see these uh, two deer running through the woods. One of them had a rack. And you can only take the buck during that time. And I, I got so excited. But those two deer, that buck chased that doe out into a field. And they ran across the field over to another man's property that I'm not allowed to hunt. And I went, well, four days, 20 seconds of, of excitement. You know, that's all I get. But I watched that doe. She went out to, to the far edge of that field and made a sharp 90 degree turn, ran up the edge of the field, made another 90 degree turn and came right back into the woods where I was sitting on a flat below me at about 40 yards. And that buck was right behind her. I took, pulled up my 30 out six, boom, one shot, boom, two shots, completely missed him. I'm not good at hitting things running. And, um, uh, I fired two rounds from a 30 out six at this buck and he didn't even look up at me. Now, I don't know about you, but I, that would get my attention. Yeah. But he was so engaged. Yeah. He was so engaged with that buck. I mean, with that doe that he didn't know, he didn't even hear it. So they ran off on down the flat. I knew I didn't hit him. I could tell by the craters in the ground behind him. I'd missed him <laughs> and sat there. Now I'm starting to rehearse a speech for my brothers-in-law who I know heard the shots and are going to be calling me on the walkie talkie and saying, what's going on. I'm, I'm rehearsing how to tell them what happened. When I hear that same crashing sound coming from my left and look, and here come the same two deer that bucks right behind her. I fired two more rounds at him, completely missed him. And, you know, I thought I heard something screaming under the roar of that gun. And I, it was that doe screaming, shoot him, shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't do her any favors. And, and he, they ran off into that field again and disappeared on that other man's property. But the point of that story is, uh, you know, Buck and Bubba have something in common. Now, the difference is the buck only deals with this madness about four to five weeks out of the year. For four to five weeks, he is a complete idiot because he abandons all caution and goes and, and chases these does and gets himself in trouble with people like me. And Bubba has the same problem with chasing women, except it's not four to five weeks out of the year. It's 365 days a year that we have the potential to be complete idiots when it comes to the woman and maintaining moral purity and forgetting 
if we get too engaged in that chase, we forget First Peter 5, 8 that says, be on the alert because the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Mm -hmm. You, if you abandon your caution, you're going to get hurt. And so, you know, I see something like that and I say, Annie, let me, let me tell you what I learned from a buck today. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's, you know, you can see it. I can see it on her face. She appreciates the fact that God is using this outdoor thing as a platform, as a classroom to teach me something. And that's what I, again, what's what I, I put in these books. Just last week, uh, I hired a rabbit hunt, uh, a, a rabbit guide. A guy came with 14 beagles. And uh, one thing that uh, that uh, a, a rabbit will do once, once you jump him, once a, a pack of dogs jumps a rabbit, that rabbit will, if you're by that dog, by those dogs, when that rabbit jumps, don't go anywhere because what's going to happen? six to eight times out of 10, that rabbit's going to run from the dogs, run in a big circle and come right back to where he was jumped. And if that's not a picture of a dog returning to its vomit, <laughs> you know, men, they'll say, I'm going to stop this. I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. And they'll, they'll go out and then they'll circle back and come right back to it, not understanding that they should have run in a straight line to pursue righteousness, as Second uh, uh, Timothy two twenty two says, flee youthful lust, but pursue righteousness. If you run out there and come back to it, you're going to get in trouble. So there may be a guy listening that's saying, "I'm going to, I'm not going to do something anymore," and then he comes right back to it. Be a smart rabbit, run in a straight line, hmm. and uh, so anyway, you see stuff that. like that. You share it with your wife; she'll appreciate. She'll get, she'll get so excited. She might say something like, man, you need a new truck. You need a new gun. <laughs> well, it doesn't hurt to fantasize. So, right. No, that's, a, that's, that's awesome. I love, I love that story. That's really, really a great yeah. message. That's awesome. Yeah. And Steve, you, you hit on, you know, two of the major, you know, visions and missions that we have here at Brothers of Merit. And that is being a better parent and being a better husband. So to wrap up here, can you give us any advice through your hunting, your you know your hunting career and the things you've done in your life that could then highlight on brotherhood, which would be the, like the stamp of what we are here for Brothers of Merit? Well, one of the most wonderful benefits of of uh, being an outdoorsman for me has been the friendships. You know, the um, brothers were born for adversity. Nathan thought when he was a kid that that meant he, he was supposed to give his sister a lot of trouble. But, um, and I'm sure you've heard that before, but, uh, uh, you know, what, what is the, um, the, the proverb that, uh, uh, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver, you know, friends, um, brothers building one another, another up with our words. Um, I remember coming back to the cabin one day hunting with a guy named Don Skurlock. Just, he's a great friend and. And uh, while I was out hunting, I got a doe that looked a lot bigger in the peep site. And when I got to it, it wasn't much bigger than a collie. So I pretty much threw it over my shoulder and headed back to the cabin with it. And I'm coming up the hill and Don's standing out on the deck and watching me walk up the hill with that deer, that little deer. And he said, Steve Chapman, you are an amazing archer. Anybody that could hit something that small. <laughs> a word fitly spoken, you know, and uh, how, how, what was the old saying that um, sorrows are halved and joys are doubled with a friend. And uh, that's good. Like when I'm out hunting with a guy and, and I, I arrow or, you know, get a I shoot a deer and I can't find it. If he's around, you know, he just, you know, kind of puts his emotional arm around you and, and he understands, you know, he's been there too. And uh, he comes alongside you and, and uh, those sorrows are halved. And boy, when you get something and you share it with one another, the joys are doubled. And spiritually speaking, that's, uh, you know, uh, what, a, what a joy it is to have a good friend. And I think, too, of those four men in Mark 2 that... Uh, helped to uh, help that paralytic get to the presence of Jesus. And he said, seeing their faith, 
uh, he made the, he made the man well. He saved him and, yeah, and yeah. healed him. Yeah. But but the scripture says, seeing their faith. And boy, is that not a picture of of how important it is to have uh, have good good friends? Yeah, definitely. So I, I appreciate your time, guys. Yeah, Steve. No, we appreciate your time. We know it's valuable, and we're super happy to have you on the show. And I think, regardless of our listeners, whether they are hunters or not. I think they are going to be able to pull a lot of great, you know, content and just things from this interview that you said that, you know, lessons and better being better fathers and husbands and things that they can do. I mean, this was amazing and you know, we're super appreciative of it. Well, you're you're most welcome and holler anytime. Yes, sir, definitely. Well, again, we really appreciate it and we hope to talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Thank you, sir. Sir. All right. All right, well, there you have it, guys. That was the interview with Steve Chapman. As usual, we hope you guys got out of it what we did. It was a phenomenal interview. He was just a super down-to-earth guy with tons of real life and real world experience, and a lot of it in the woods. And what we thought was cool about it is Taylor and I can't relate to the woods aspect, so hearing that part from another man actually brought in a whole different way of looking at manhood and brotherhood and parenthood in that manner. So... Taylor, what you got for him? Yeah, absolutely. And that, just real quick, that was one of the big things for me as well, was when you think about hunting, typically it's solidarity and it's by yourself up in a tree stand. But when he talked about brotherhood and he talked about how uh, the importance of being connected with other men, uh, and I love that. So we also wanted to just shout out real quick some of the places where you can find more of his content. Um, that is at Steve and Annie com. Him and his wife are musicians and you can find their songs there. You can also find them at bandcamp.com slash Steve and Annie Chapman Chapman. And he has written 14 books. Yep. 14. He's and in. all of those are on Amazon. So you can find them at amazon.com and you can check that, that out. If you're an avid hunter, I would definitely encourage you. And also look on our Instagram because we have a giveaway coming with some of those books as well. Absolutely. Stay tuned for those. So, And if you need to and you didn't get all that, go to our website, past guest tab, and you can see all those links as well as check the show description and you'll have a link to his website. Check back with us next week. We are going to have Mr. Charles Causey. He is actually an Army chaplain, and I cannot wait to interview him, especially with my background in the military and the path that I want to take is, you know, into the chaplaincy at some point. It's going to be amazing, and we're so looking forward to that and you know, to him talking about his book, Words and Deeds, and just his experiences as an Army chaplain, what he's gone through and what he's seen. So um, on that note, Taylor, let's uh, let these guys roll. All right, we'll see you. See you.